was known as the Sword of Allah, one of the greatest generals in history, one of Islam's greatest heroes. His name, Khalid ibn al-Walid. Sunnah Followers presents a new series presented by Ustad Mukhtar Shahid. Coming soon, so stay tuned. Streaming on all major platforms. Channel Sunnah Followers. Talked about uh, Khalid's upbringing and more so his uh when he converted to Islam. So it was he, um, Khalid, Amr bin Aus, and another famous Sahaba named Uthman, whose whose family still holds the keys to the Kaaba. And um, it just came time, his brother was very instrumental in him becoming a Muslim. Uh, his brother wrote him a letter when the Muslims during the, the uh the battle of, uh, I'm sorry, when they came to perform uh, uh, Umrah, and a lot of the Quraysh could not stand the fact of the Muslims coming in and performing Umrah, and Khalid and a lot of other of the uh, Quraysh would kind of leave the city. But he had a, a letter that his brother had left for him, and he told him, he said, listen, uh, he's amazed at somebody with his intelligence um, is not a Muslim. And that the Prophet Sallallahu himself had asked, where is Khalid? And so this had a profound effect on Khalid's heart that the Prophet Sallallahu had um, specifically asked about him. Now, Khalid, you don't necessarily get the feeling that he had that type of hatred and enmity towards Islam. He loved to fight. He was a natural soldier. His tribe was responsible, Bani Mahzum, they were responsible for the, uh, the, the military part of Quraysh. So at a very young age, he knew how to ride horses and camels, and he knew how to use lances and swords and any other weapon that, uh, and bows and arrows and that kind of thing. And so Bani Mahzum was known for that, and he was the best amongst Bani Mahzum. So he didn't have this 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 hatred for Islam. This like his uh, his uh, cousin was uh, Abu Jahl, and he didn't have that type of thing. But it was his tribe. He was responsible for a major turn of events uh, during the Battle of Uhud because the Muslims didn't listen to what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. They ended up running after the spoils of war, and Khalid took advantage of this, and he changed the whole entire battle where the Prophet Sallallahu himself had ended up getting hurt. So as a, a result of this, um, he's, you know, life is going on and it just came to a point where he said, Islam is going to be the winner. Islam is going to be dominant. Islam is going to be the winner. And, and, it, and it makes sense, you know, that he had been fighting against this. And a lot of his friends, Omar is now Muslim. Um, uh, uh, Abu Bakr, people who he respected, is now Muslim. You know, all of these people are leaving, and they would make this this statement like Mecca is as a place that they don't really um, uh, are not familiar with anymore. They don't recognize it because a lot of the people who are notables, a lot of the people who are there, their friends have um, become Muslim, and they went into Medina, and so Alhamdulillah, he ends up taking a shahada, and his first major encounter was the Battle of Muta. And somebody had asked, was Ikrima, the, the last class that we had, Ikrima is Abu Jahal's son. And so Ikrima was not Muslim yet. So they were asking, was Ikrima uh, involved um, side by side with Khalid? Not yet. So Ikrima was still a non-Muslim. The Battle of Muta is a response that the Christians had slaughtered and killed a Muslim messenger. And this is definitely taboo. It doesn't make a difference. Whatever a messenger said to you, you did not kill a messenger. And that's maybe where, like, look, don't kill a messenger. That's that's That was like a for real term. You killed, the, the messenger came with whatever, a king or whoever told him to say something um, to, and if and they were to be allowed to leave and, you know, that kind of thing. 
So they killed a Muslim who was delivering a message and the Prophet Sallallahu response was um, Zayd ibn Haritha and um, Jafar, his cousin, and um, another, I, I want to say Abu Rawaha had all gotten killed in the Battle of Muta. And the Muslims were grossly outnumbered against like 200,000 soldiers. And this is where Khalid, he takes command because the Prophet Sallallahu did not um, give like who was to die. So it was a thing. Zayd was in charge. If Zayd gets killed, this person is in charge. If this person gets killed, then this person is in charge. They didn't have that after and Khalid took and, and maneuvered himself out of the position where um, they, they were able to come back to Medina. And mashallah, they got criticized behind this because their thing is that you should have fought you should have died as martyrs. And it said that some people were even throwing, there's some opinions that people were throwing dust at them for them, um, from them leaving. Okay. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he said that this Khalid is the sword of Allah. And this was basically saying that they would be victorious um, in the future. And uh, mashallah, as time goes on, and as we go through this journey, we definitely will see that Khalid uh, lived up to what the Prophet Sallallahu said because he's definitely going to be encountering those same types of people but under the leadership of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Okay? So um, we want to fast forward to the entry into Mecca. So this is around uh, the eighth year of Hijri and it was not a uh, so-called a battle. And this is what I was saying before. We had the Battle of Badr, Battle of Uhud. This was a um, somewhat of a bloodless operation. So they didn't want in there. They, they did. The Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam did not want to go into Mecca with the intention of shedding blood. And what happened? The Treaty of Hudaybiyah was a treaty that they were supposed to have peace for 10 years. And they weren't supposed to attack each other. That was one of the conditions of the treaty. And so what happens is that a uh, uh, a tribe had attacked, an, attacked another tribe that was on the side of the Muslims. And the Quraysh had supported them uh, with men and supported them with weapons in order to do what they did. And so therefore, the treaty was broke. And so now um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as the Muslims are stronger, it's about 10,000 soldiers coming into um, uh, Mecca from all sides. And Alhamdulillah, Khalid is in this army now. And it, it's, it's so um, of a wonderful sight where you had somebody who was fighting against the Muslims and now you have somebody who is fighting for Islam. So he was the only one actually um, that had, had encountered some type of fighting. So for the most part, there was no fighting like we would think a battle would be. But under Khalid, there was a one group that came in from the right, another group that came in from the left, and another group that came in down the middle. And so the Muslims were all coming from all sides. And so Khalid had actually uh, experienced fighting from whole other Ikrima and, Sa and Safwan. These was like his, his buddies in the times of Jahiliya. And, um, and uh, Ikrima was um was married one of them was married to Khalid's sister and so Islam we know canceled all of the relationships and friendships that they had in the days of of ignorance okay and so it didn't make a difference if they were cool at one time he was a Muslim now they were still polytheists they were trying to fight against the Muslims and if Khalid had to kill one of them he most certainly would have done it you know and there's certain opinions that he saw they saw Khalid coming. They killed some. They were uh, fighting some Muslims, and when they saw Khalid, they kind of ran off and, and and fled the city. So the Quraysh, they opened up their bows and they drew their swords, and this is exactly what Khalid was waiting for. And, you know, because he loved to fight, and um, so he was charged with the uh, Quraysh position. And um, after a short clash, he was able to drive them back. And so about 12 of the Quraysh were killed and only two Muslims were killed. And like I said, Ikrima and uh, Safwan ended up fleeing. Now, there's some uh, opinions, too, that um, Suhail ibn Amr, 
who was the person who negotiated the treaty, that he was also in this mix of fighting against the Muslims when they came into Mecca, and he himself was on the run after this as well. So when he withdrew with the engagement with Khalid, Ikrima, he hid in the town um, uh, in Yemen. He went somewhere with Yemen, and he had the intention of, of catching a boat and going to Abyssinia. So this goes to show you the close relationship that the Arabs had with the Ab with Abyssinia. Okay, so this is what he planned on doing. So his wife goes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He she uh, pleads her case to him, and she says, "Listen, you know, Messenger of Allah, if he becomes Muslim, you know, you know, can you not kill him?" And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "You know, of course not. If he repented, he becomes Muslim. Absolutely, you know, what I'm saying, tell him to come back." And so she goes immediately. And, and finds out where he is, and um, he did, and what he did, he ends up accepting Islam, and he becomes Muslim. So Safwan, now Safwan is the son of um, Umayyah bin Khalaf, who used to torture Bilal ibn Rabah. Okay, and so he wasn't on a war criminals list, and so, but he still feared for his life, and he went to Jeddah with the intention of also crossing the Red Sea and going to Abyssinia as well. But a friend of his saw him and he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to spare his life and, uh, and accept his Islam if he became Muslim. So um, the Prophet didn't have any intention if he caught up with Safwan, uh, he wasn't on a list to, to kill him because there were a couple people who were executed when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had come into, uh, uh, into Mecca. One of them, just as an example, one of them was a person who fought against the Muslims before and the messenger of Allah let him go. And he told him, he said, listen, don't be with them anymore. I'm going to let you go. And then what happens? The person shows up on the battlefield to fight the Muslims again. You understand? So he was put to death. It was a woman who had uh, made this, these, uh, these really foul, nasty, um, the things of poetry about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and she was warned to stop and she wouldn't stop. And uh, she was executed and it might have been, and it's a couple other people too um, uh, uh, so uh, that were executed as well. So Safwan wasn't on that list. He was not like uh, Abu Jahal where he was going and just murdering, you know, Muslims uh, wholeheartedly. He wasn't doing that. And, you know, he was upset as his father got killed in the, uh, in the Battle of Badr, and um, he was somebody of, of supposedly what they would call like a notable. So he was somebody in the society. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had accepted his um, his uh, shahada, and he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, could he have two months to think about becoming Muslim? Because Safwan and Ikrima, when uh, Khalid ibn Walid was going to uh, accept Islam, he went to Ikrima first and said, listen, the situation is, is, is clear. The Muslims is, is going to win. Eventually, we're going to lose this. The Muslims are going to win. And we know that what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying is correct. And Ikrima's thing was that I don't care if everybody except Islam, I'm not going to become a Muslim. And Safwan's attitude was the same. And so he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, you know, Ya Rasulullah, could you give me about two months to make my mind up if I want to become a Muslim or not? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had given him, he said, I'd take four months. Okay. So this goes to show you the graciousness of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there was, a, in this situation, the Prophet had come to know that Khalid had killed a bunch of Mushrikeen. And um, he wasn't really happy about that because he wanted to avoid bloodshed at all costs. And he knew how violent um, Khalid was. He had a very violent nature. And when he went in, he went all the way in. He didn't go halfway. He went all the way. And so his explanation, when he explained to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as to why he did what he did, um, this was accepted by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said, you know, you did the right thing. So um, he just was hitting back as to what they were I'm um, trying to do to him. So it was the nature that whenever he struck, he struck extremely hard. So when um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is in Mecca, 
They, he's, you know, forgiving people and he's telling these people like, listen, you got to get rid of these idols. So remember, Mecca was the hub. It had uh, over 300 idols around it. So he's saying, look, you got to get rid of all of these idols. You accept Islam. All of that stuff is over and done with. And so Uzzah, Lot and Uzzah were uh, and uh, Hobal. These were uh, main so-called gods in, in Mecca. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has sent Khalid himself to go in to destroy this, this idol called Uzza. So he sent out with about um, 30 men, uh, 30 horsemen to a place called Nahla to, in order to destroy Uzza. So what happened, there was two Uzzas, two statues that they had this stupid. They had two idols that they worship. One of them was fake. So Allah knows best as to why that one was there. Maybe it was for, you know, whatever they had it. Allah knows best. But one of the Uzzas was fake. So Khalid, when he he located that one first and he destroyed it. So when he went back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, did it appear that you, uh, there, there appears to be there was two Uzzas and a real Uzza and a fake one. He said Khalid first located the fake and destroyed it. Then he returned to the Prophet to repeat the completion. And the messenger of Allah said, did you see anything unusual? And so he said, no. You know, he went, he's like, no, messenger, well, I didn't see anything unusual. He said, then you didn't destroy Oza. See, he said, go, he said, go back. So he was upset that he got duped. And so he went back and he rode back to Nahla. And this time he found the real Oza. And the custodian of the temple of Oza, he fled. And now listen to this. He fled. And then what he did is he took us like a sword and put it around the neck of the goddess in order like it was going to defend herself against Khalid. You know, and then so he threw it a took sword around the, the, the statue and then ran off and it was going to go. But Khalid, when he entered the temple, so they had Uzza in a temple, he was face, he said, with a naked black woman who stood in the way and wailed. So you kind of get a, a like this almost shaitanic type of interaction. Um, and she was naked. And so now he knows what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was talking about. You know, he did, this is something that was out of the ordinary. He said, you see anything unusual? So he sees this woman. She's wailing. She's she's naked. And then what he did is he ends up destroying that um, the real Uzza. OK, so. I used to hear about this story when I was when I was young about Khalid. And now I know where this comes from. So this is around um 630 um after the um after the Hijri for us. Yeah, this or uh, um six thirty. So this is about two years before the uh the life ending of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So after the destructions of the idols. There was a situation that happened with a tribe called Bani Jazima. And the Prophet Wasallam, what he did is that he sent a number of expeditions to the tribes living in neighboring Mecca, uh, around Mecca, to call them to Islam. And he instructed the commanders not to fight those um, who accepted the call. Okay? So the Prophet Wasallam's intention, once again, is to avoid bloodshed. So um, the expedition to the area of a place called Tihama, and this was south of Mecca, and it was commanded by Khalid. So it consisted of 350 horsemen and several from the um, tribal contingents, and the largest being from Banu Sul uh, Sulaim. And it included some Ansars and some immigrants. So alhamdulillah, and this is important too, who better to go with you on a mission like that than uh, the best of the, the Sahabas, the Ansars and the immigrants. These are people from the very beginning. So they go with Khalid and their objective was to uh, uh, was to go to this place. And this was about 50 miles from Mecca. So when Khalid reached this one particular place, which was about 15 miles away, um, he met Bani Jazima. And a tribesman saw the Muslims and took up their weapons at the same time calling and saying, we have submitted. We have established prayers and we built a masjid. Then why, Khalid said, then why do you got weapons? And he said, we got a feud with a certain uh, Arab tribes and we had to defend ourselves against them. Now, 
one of the things that I question about that is they already acknowledged and knew that the, it was Muslims that was coming there to come deal with them. So they pick up the, the uh, their swords and their weapons. Now, what is Khalid thinking? Khalid is thinking that this is a, a trick because we already know, and uh, when we talked about the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there were some people who tried to act like they were interested in Islam and some of the best of the Sahaba that had memorized the Quran were very pious uh, Muslims. They waited till they got them out and then they killed all of these Muslims that was with them. So this is not something that would be, you know, especially for people who might have just become Muslim. And we'll see that a lot of them may have become Muslim, but it wasn't in their heart like it was with the Ansar and the, and the, and the uh, Muhajirin. For people who sincerely like Khalid, Khalid went to the Prophet Wasallam and accepted Islam. Amr bin Aus went to the Prophet Wasallam and accepted Islam. You have people when they go into Mecca, it's more so the Muslims in conquered and let's go ahead and we're going to go ahead and accept Islam. So it's a little bit different. So <clears throat> this is not beyond somebody to do something like this. You know, are we Muslim? You know, and then they go ahead and they slaughter the people. So Khalid, being a soldier like he is, he was like, nah, he didn't want to fall for that. So what he did, but this is the backstory a little bit as to why these things get, this is a little bit of an interesting turn. This particular tribe, Khalid had some beef with them and his family had some beef with them prior to him becoming a Muslim. So one time, the background story is, is that when uh, his uncle and Abdul Rahman ibn Aw's father was coming from Yemen, these people robbed a caravan and killed uh, 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 Abdul Rahman ibn Aw's father and killed Khalid's uncle. So there was this situation that was brewing and had never necessarily been done. Now, uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Aw, he killed a person that killed his father. He avenged his blood. And um, but the death of Khalid's uncle wasn't avenged. So they were very big on revenge. So all this happened during the times of times of Jahiliyyah, or for those who are um not Muslim and they hear that term, this is the what we call Jahiliyyah is the days of ignorance, somebody prior to um living their life prior to becoming a Muslim. So the people of uh Bani Jazima now began to dispute with the man who was warning them against Khalid. He said, do you want us slaughtered? They asked him, all of the tribes had laid down their arms and become Muslims. The war is over. And after a brief argument, the tribe laid down their arms. The cause of which happened next is a lot of historians is not necessarily clear. So we don't know if Khalid saw something, if somebody did something, we don't know. But he could have Khalid is a new Muslim. It's saying he might have only been Muslim for like a couple months. So he's only so he doesn't necessarily know all of the rules. He's not he hasn't been on all of these uh, uh missions with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, the Muslims learned a great deal of how to behave, how to fight, who not to kill, that kind of thing when they were going with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so this he might have had this kind of re reverted back to this vindictiveness in uh from the times of Jahiliya. Okay, so um, and or it could have been an excessive uh Islamic zeal that he had and figured that these people were trying to play him, that they really wasn't Muslim, and it was just they was trying to play him. So the tribesmen laid their arms down. And Khalid ordered his men to tie their hands behind them. Then he ordered the captives to be put to the sword. Now, this is something that was not cool at all. And we also we know that there was a situation with Usama bin Zayd, whom the Prophet Wasallam loved. He loved Usama. Usama went out on a mission, and the Messenger of Allah, Usama was victorious, and the Messenger of Allah, he was um, all excited. So he's telling Usama, come here, you know, tell me what happened, tell me what happened. So Usama's telling him what happened, and then he makes a statement and says, yeah, and there was this guy, and he said, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, and the Messenger of Allah, I just killed him anyway. And then he said he saw the face of the Messenger of Allah change. And he said, what, like, he was like, what you, what did you say? I mean, he was, 
he was I had to he was fighting me. I had to drop on him. And then he uh and when I was gonna kill him, he said, I shut away Laila Haid Allah, shut away Muhammad Rasulullah. And I killed him, and he only said that because of the fact that he wanted to save his skin from, from getting killed. And the Prophet sallam, kept repeating, Did you were you did you open his chest and see what was in his heart? He might have had a moment of clarity. And he might have really said, did you see? And Osama said that he was so regretful. He makes this the statement. I wish I hadn't become Muslim until after that day. OK. And so this was something that was very serious of what Khalid just did. So. Um, Battle Sulaim, they um, obeyed the order and they they tied the captives up and then they and they took did what Khalid told them to do. So the other. Um, tribal contingents, they refused that, especially the Ansars and the Muhajirin. They was like, it's no way in the world. So um, Ibn Omar um, and Abu Qatada, they went to, back to the Prophet Wasallam and told him what Khalid had done. Okay, so they immediately run and the Prophet was horrified. He was, he was really upset. So he said he raised his hands up in a, in a door and he said, oh, Allah, I am not responsible for what Khalid has done. I didn't tell him to do that. And he said, then he sent Ali with a great deal of money to soothe the feelings of Bani Jazima and to pay the blood money. So we know that this is something that was prior to Islam and it's something that stayed. It's compensation, basically. You kill somebody, maybe unjustly, then, you know, uh, the family could either demand the family can either demand that you get killed or they can accept the money. Okay. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sent Ali um, to carry <coughs> this uh, blood money. And it was extremely generous what he gave the people who lost the members of their tribe. And so the anger went down. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to give them more. And then he to give them more and then give them more. And then everything was cool. So Khalid was now sent. Um, for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Messenger of Allah wanted to see him. And he said, you know, like, why did you do that? What forced you to do that? So Khalid said that he didn't believe that they was really Muslim. So there you go. And then he had the impression that um, they was deceiving him. And he believed that he was killing in the way of Allah. So this is something that he said. Now, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf is sitting there with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he basically accused them. He said, you lying. He said, you got an issue with them before. I know why you did what you did. And you got an issue with them because of something that happened to your uncle prior to Islam. And so now, what Khalid thought he can get out of the predicament, he said, well, listen, this, I, you know, your father, I did this, he killed your father. And he said, man, you, you know, that's a, you lying because I killed the person who killed my father. You on some other stuff of the vindictive stuff for your family. And so he said, you ordered the slaughter of Bani Jazima in revenge for your uncle, uh, Fakiha. And so this led to, they was, they got into it really bad. Now you can imagine Abdul Rahman ibn Auf is not scared and the Khalid definitely is not scared. And so he says, and this was the mistake on the part of Khalid. For Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, who is he? He's one of the 10 promised paradise. He's not a lightweight in Islam. He's one of the earliest converts to Islam. He's been with all of the missions, all of the, the, the suffering that the Muslims did. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf was right there with the Prophet wasallam. So this is something he had a special status in, uh, in, in, in Islam. And when the people have become Muslim, they understood and they had a lot of respect for those who had accepted Islam early on. OK, so before the argument could get, uh, get out of hand, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he intervened and he sternly said, leave my companions alone. O Khalid, if you possessed a mountain of gold and spent it in the way of Allah, you would not achieve the status of my companions. Now, um. Khalid is the, a companion of the Prophet of Islam too, but this is not the point. The point that he was making was that this is somebody who deserved, you got, you, you got to give him more respect than that, you know, and I want you to stop. 
Okay. So he was um he was forgiven for what he had done because it could have been that his heart was in the right place. His actions was wrong, but his heart was in the right place. But one thing about it, and as we'll see, that the conic never made that mistake again. You know, and we we always you kind of get when you hear things about Khalid, you get the idea that he was just like this uh brute soldier type of person. Khalid was very knowledgeable about Islam and he was very compassionate when he needed to be. And he would definitely just go, he would try to call people to Islam. And if they didn't and they tried to fight him, they, they suffered greatly for that. But he wasn't some bloodthirsty general going in there and just murdering people. He wasn't like that at all. Okay. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, billahi min regime. Assuredly, Allah did help you in many battlefields. And on the day of Hunayn, behold, your great numbers elated you, but you availed um, nothing. The land for all that is wide did constrain you and you turned back in retreat. But Allah did pour his calm on the messenger and the believers and he sent down forces which you saw not. And he punished the unbelievers. Thus does he reward those without faith. Thus he rewards those. Um, again, Allah, again, uh, um, will Allah after this turn in mercy to whom he will. And Allah is all forgiving and most merciful. Okay. So this is about the battle of Hunayn. And Huazin is a, a tribe. This is uh, northeast of Mecca, and Thaqif is um, in the area of Taif. Now, when Aisha Raylata Anha asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what was the worst times of your life? He brings up Taif. He goes out of Mecca to preach about Islam and Taif, and what did they do? They stoned him, and they stoned him so bad that he had blood gushing out of his his head and then his body to the point where like, you know, blood gets sticky. And they said it was like clogging up his shoes. That's how bad he was injured, how bad they did it. And so these Hawazin and Thaqif were like neighboring tribes. And so what they were going to try to do is something similar to the Battle of the Trench. They were combine forces. They see Islam is gaining. Islam is in Medina. And then they sweeping across all of these people becoming Muslim. And now they ended up taking over Mecca. So they figured that they got to be coming. That we got to be next. And they don't have short memories. They know what they did to the Prophet wasallam a long time ago. So their thing is like, nope, we need to combine our forces and we need to fight against them. And so they concentrated at a place called uh, Altas. And this is near Hunayn. And it was about. 12,000 of them, and they was commanded by this young, fiery um, general. His name was Malik bin, uh, bin Auf. Okay? So what he did, and we talked about this in the the, uh, the life of the Prophet Wasallam when we were dealing with the Battle of Hunayn. So what he ended up doing, in a desperation type of move, he ordered that the families, all of the families, women, children, they, the uh, uh, stuff that they held dear, like cattle, maybe some horses, that they, they had to bring them out to the battlefield, okay? And so one of the more seasoned veterans who was old and, you know, he couldn't necessarily get out like he used to, his name was Duray. And he said, um, like, basically, what are you doing? You know, he said, I hear, um, you know, he could hear women and stuff like that. And he said, I have ordered the families and the flocks to muster with the army and every man will fight with his family and his property behind him, thus will giving him more courage. OK, so men fight with swords and spears, not with women and children. This is what uh, Duraid said. And he said, put the families and flocks at a safe distance from the field of battle. If we win, they can join us. If we lose, at least they'll be from a safe distance. So he's saying. You know, the, the, the mindset of this one general, this uh, Malik bin Auf, is like, look, if we got their wives and their children out there, they're not going to run. It's going to encourage them to be more uh, um, um, courageous because what will happen is they are going to uh, 
be taken as captives if they lose. So if they see that their kids is out there, the women is out there, then it will make them fight. And this person named Duraid is saying that's a horrible idea. Horrible. And it was for the most part. So Huazin bought their families, their flocks, and they camped. And he didn't listen to what um, Duray said. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't want to, um, uh, uh, more bloodshed. But he had no choice but to deal with this enemy, right? And because remember, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said he will never allow for somebody to come and to invade Medina again like they did the, uh, uh, the, the trench. The bat in the battle of the trench. He's not. The Prophet Sallallahu said, from now on, we're never fighting another defensive battle. We're always going and we're fighting offensive battles. So we're going to take it to them. Whoever wants some, we're going to take it to them. We're not waiting for them to come to us. So um, what they did, they end up around the, this is the eighth year of Hijri. And so uh, the Muslims set out from Mecca. And the army consisted. Now, this is shortly after in Mecca. So they already had 10,000 uh, 10, soldiers that came into Mecca. And now you had a bunch of people. So this goes to show you how many people accepted Islam, too. So there's 2,000 new converts from Mecca. Abu Sufyan is one. Um, by this time, uh, Ikrima is Muslim and Safwan is Muslim as well. OK, so the new Muslims were doubtful. Um, uh, as Islam entered into their hearts, so you know it's like we Muslim, yeah, we Muslim now, but you know we don't. We, Allah knows best as to what they felt about Islam really in their heart. Okay, so they um among them, like I said, was Abu Sufyan and and Safwan. So the later um he, he was Muslim now, and what he and the Safwan had. Um, lend the Muslims a hundred coats of mail and um, for the battle. So alhamdulillah, this is what he did. So the Muslims advanced from Mecca with about um, 700 men from Banu Sulaim, and these were under the command of Khalid ibn Walid. So around January 31st, the Muslims arrived in the Valley of Hunayn, and they established a camp there. So the advance guard against uh, again, of Banu Sulaim was under Khalid's command. So it marched with various Muslim units, including 2,000 Meccans. So the camp was left standing as the base of operation. And the first glow of dawn appeared in the eastern sky. The advance guard entered um, into this uh, particular area and eagerly anticipating a live battle, they were going to surprise Malik ibn Aus. They were going to uh, surprise Huwazin. And so Khalid increased his pace until, and then the storm all heck broke out. So Khalid was the first to receive a shock of an ambush. So the quiet of dawn was shattered with a thousand piercing yells and arrows, not by the tens, not by the twenties, but by the hundreds. And they came like hailstones. It said whistling and hissing and striking horses and men. So they got a lot of the Muslims. So Bani Salim did not stop uh, um, to act against the enemy and they did not stop to take over, or, um, to take cover. They turned as one man and they bolted. And then Khalid started shouting to them for them to come back. But through all of the confusion and noise, they were gone. So Malik, what he did is during the nighttime, he moved his army into a particular area, and then he surprised the Muslims at Hunayn. So he's somebody that is, is, is somebody that's a formidable opponent. So during the night, um, he allowed no room for any type of maneuver for the Muslims. You know, a lot of times if anybody has been to Mecca, it's a lot of hills and mountains and that kind of thing. So easily, and if you're talking about it's pitch black and they're not expecting anything, and you know, your eyes can adjust to the dark. So you can move fast through the dark and they're not really expecting nothing, especially if they think they're going to take them by surprise. So the enemy took the Muslims by surprise. So he delayed his move till after dusk. So the Muslims would continue to believe that his army was at a particular place. Then he placed it in ambush 
and the file of Hunayn with the intention of annihilating Muslims and drawing them back in the panic to Mecca and, uh, and beyond. So behind the site of the ambush was a narrow pass which Malik could uh, withdraw in case of the battle didn't go according to his plan. So he thought this out very good. Very good. So most of the new Meccan converts was actually delighted at what happened to the Muslims. So this, once again, this shows there's a difference between those who just became Muslim and those who were Muslim for a long period of time. So we know there's a difference, right? And he said, so Safwan was there and he had his half brother was there. So his half, his half brother now makes the statement and said, now the sorcery of Muhammad will be exposed. So that's what he said. So, so Safwan told him to be quiet. And he said, may Allah break your mouth. I would rather see a man of Quraysh ruling over us than a man from Huwazin. So once again, there's the situation of them dealing with uh, this um, kind of tribalism thing still. You know, about who should run over the man of Mecca. This That's what uh, Safwan said. But his brother, his half brother, made this count, this comment, this negative comment about the Prophet Wasallam. So the Prophet was left standing on the track with about nine of his companions. And you know, he goes and he's yelling out and he tells them, Oh, Ansar, oh companions, you know, I'm the son of Abdullah, so on and so forth, boom, boom, boom. And alhamdulillah, the Muslims end up getting themselves um back together again. So I didn't want to go over um this whole battle. Because we kind of went over this during the lifetime of the Prophet Wasallam, and we want to um, kind of, you know, stick with uh, Khalid. So this group, when they reassembled, when the Muslims are able to get themselves together and they reassembled, and the Prophet Wasallam, he pressed this uh, an advantage. So he organized a strong cavalry group, and in this cavalry group was um, Khalid. And so Khalid regained control. So now Khalid got his mind together now as to what's going on. And he had missed the Muslim counterattack because Khalid got hit. So I, I meant to, I forgot to say that in this barrage of hit, he got hit and got injured really bad. And so with the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam, he blew on his wound and he was up and he was good. And so once again, this is another miracle from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he blew on him and he was fit and he was strengthened for battle again. So he got up with Banu Salim and they go and they attacked his position and they was under the command of Zubair ibn Awam, another famous Sahabi that was promised paradise. And they go and they attacked his position in the valley. And so the whole valley was now in Muslim hands. So now they got this and Zubair left uh, um, uh, this particular place and pass and, hold it, and held it as a firm base and they guarded it against the return of Huwazin. Okay, so you got Thaqif. Thaqif is from Taif. Huwazin is from um, uh, this other place. I'm esca escaping my mind where they're from. But so on the arrival of the Muslims, a fierce clash took place in this place, Altas. So Abu Amir killed nine men in a personal combat and he was killed by his 10th adversary. And whereupon the command of the Muslim group was taken by Abu Musa and he continued to attack uh, Altas until Huwazin broke and they fled. So the camp of Huwazin fell into the Muslim hands and the Muslim group was joined by a cavalry of Zubair and Khalid was leading that cavalry, okay? So this was the first time that Khalid had been taken by surprise. And he had always known the value of a surprise because we'll see inshallah as time goes on that Khalid has uh, taken many enemies by surprise. OK, but this is the first time that he was on the receiving end of it. And he saw otherwise how these brave men had panicked and all of a sudden had ran. They got hit so bad that Abu Sufyan, he said that they would have ran to the Red Sea, that that's how much they was trying to get up out there. <laughs> so uh, it, it was a, it was a trial for them. So two weeks had passed. <laughs> And there was no end to this fight. There was no sight because they now probably in a position that or they in a fort or position that the Muslims can't can't penetrate them. So Thaqif wasn't coming out to fight. They had tons of arrows. They had tons of food. 
where they wasn't going to run out of their stuff and the Muslims um, could, uh, couldn't could get them to come out to fight. So every time they approached the town, they were driven back with arrows. So one day Abu Sufyan also took part um, uh, towards the town and stopped and he uh, an arrow um, with his eye. And he lived with one eye after that. Now, there's some differences of opinion with that because there's uh, there was another battle that I understand that he lost his eye in that in that battle. I don't believe it was in um, uh, Hunayn, but Allah knows best. It's not really important. So February was cold, and, and especially in the region where Taif was, and um, the weather became unpleasant. And so there's no sight of this anything for the Muslims. So one of the Sahaba, he says to the messenger of Allah, he said, Ya Rasulullah, he took, you know, I want to, you know, the, the Prophet Sallallahu took shura. So he got his war council together. And one of them said, they said, Ya Rasulullah, you know, when you corner a fox in his hole, if you stay long enough and catch the fox, but if you leave the fox in his hole, it does, uh, it does you no harm. So basically, this is a, a, a really beautiful, poetic way of let's get out of here. You know, Islam is growing, right? The chokehold is growing. They can't come out of there because if they do, they still now you got more people becoming Muslim. So the chokehold is going to be on them even more so than it is now. They won't be able to leave once they run out of food, once they run out of water, if they got water in there, whatever. Once they run out of that, they got to come and they got to deal with it. So we're taking all of these hits. Let's just leave. So Abu Bakr said, let's go back to uh, Mecca. Omar said, let's go back to Mecca. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi um, was in favor of that. So there were some hot-headed Muslims um, who protested. You know, like, we should stay messenger of Allah. We shouldn't let them get over get over on us. We uh, we might get them this time. Blah, blah, blah. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, oh, no problem. Ain't no thing. We'll definitely, no, y'all go ahead and y'all try that. And so they went the next time and they got barraged even worse. And then they said, yeah, let's let uh messenger of Allah, let's go on ahead and roll out. <laughs> so Alhamdulillah. And mashallah, uh, the people of um of uh Hunayn, they end up becoming Muslim. You know what I mean? And we talked about that. And um the Muslims had uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had taken some captives from them and had given them an opportunity, you know what I mean, for them to accept Islam, but it was too late. And they said, the Prophet of Islam said, you can either have your family back or your stuff back. Which one you want? And they said, we're going to take our families. You know what I mean? And then, mashallah, and that's what ended up happening. So what I think I'm going to do is, inshallah, I'm going to stop there and open up the floor for um, any uh, questions or comments, inshallah. Bismillah question from okay okay i see it i see it ibrahim okay ibrahim the little kid here he's asking he said so this is what they do when they argue those shiites argue about Khalid, saying he killed some people wrongfully that's what they're lying on him about is that story you know what i'm not too familiar with their the shiites accuse them of all kind of stuff that's a lie. Anything they say, you this is just a lie. You know what I mean? So um that they could probably try to use that for um as some type of justification. But the thing about it is, is that he had he made a judgment call, you know, and he when the judgment call he made wasn't necessarily the right judgment call, but he felt like a lot of other people would feel is uh you know that uh, he they was not they weren't Muslim. You know, they were faking like they were Muslim and that their situation wasn't sincere. And, you know, subhanAllah, let's keep it all the way real. You in a battlefield, you fight against some people, you in a battlefield, and then somebody, yeah, you got, you got them in there. They were just shooting at you. And then you, you know, and then they, you got the, the up on them and you're getting ready to kill them. And they say, I should have went like the high Allah, show them Muhammad or Rasulullah. You know, it's a lot of people that might fail that test. I'm not saying it's right, but it's a, a lot of people. You just was trying to kill me. You understand? Or you, you know, when he approached them, they, they drew their weapons. They knew they was Muslim. 
So the thing is, is that if you know I'm Muslim and, and the war is over with and you built a masjid and you submitted and all of that stuff and you know that we Muslim, why are you drawing your swords out on us? You know, your weapons. And then they came up with this thing about, you know, and, you know, like I said before, this happened to the Muslims before where they were somebody tried to act like they was interested in Islam and they murdered a bunch of companions. And so Khalid was um, being, so there's a difference of opinion as to why he may have done it. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, listened to his excuse. Basically, he scolded him not to do something, don't make a mistake like that again. And he didn't make that mistake again. You know what I'm saying? He didn't make that mistake. So that's, so that's the thing with that. Okay, one of the news. Yeah, I'm not too familiar what they accuse him of, of Khalid. And this might be the situation that he, they're talking about, but now we have a clear understanding as to why he did what he may have done. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he compensated those uh, tribes for that particular incident. Okay, Brother Edward, who's one of our new Shahadas, he says, this is really great. What I learned from this is once again, I made the right choice because a law is forgiving. It, I learned from that part of his story that a law forgives all sins. I mean, I may mean, a law uh, bless you for reaffirming my belief, brother. I mean, I mean, I mean. Okay, here's another question. Okay, so this sister here is asking. She said, "Was call it married?" To Layla at this time, or that was after this? That's after. Yeah, Kyla, he marries Layla um, under the uh, the uh, caliphate. That, that's a, we're, we'll get to that story. That's an in <laughs> that's an interesting story. That might be another thing that the Shiites might try to criticize him on. But he was, and and and, and that's you know to bring that up. Uh, it shows when he's corresponding with Abu Bakr about that situation. It shows his Islamic knowledge as to why he did what he did. And Abu Bakr was like, he's a hundred percent right. And he was, he was right what he did. You know what I mean? And, and how he, how he went about doing whatever he did, you know? So, um, he definitely wasn't ignorant about Islam, you know, but no, he, he marries, uh, Layla, um, under the Caliph of Abu Bakr. And this is when he, he goes and deals with her husband, who is basically a, a Muratan. He's an apostate. He refuses to pay the zakah. Um, he refused to pay Zakah, and he also aided and abetted in killing other Muslims in his tribe. You know, so that's how that ends up happening. Okay, another question from another sister. She says, he sounds so manly. Is there any description on how he looked? Yeah, we talked about that. I mean, inshallah, I could go back uh, and try to find it again. Um, and then we'll talk maybe uh, next class, inshallah, I could I could do that, you know, but it talked about he was somebody with a big, thick beard, somebody here. Uh, he was muscular, um, well defined features. He was tall. Um, you know, it, it kind of gave that description. She's uh, uh, another sister here. Thank you for she's on YouTube. Thank God. So I can see that one better. Put it up here. She said, Assalamu alaikum, alhamdulillah. I'm glad the prophet made the statement that Khalid was a companion. Thank you. Yes, most definitely. Oh, okay. Good job, Brother Edward. Look at this question. Brother Edward said, I remember when you taught the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Is that part also what the prophet meant when Allah said the people before the treaty are not the same as those that came after? Good memory, though. <laughs> well, <do you> not? <laughs> yeah, well, he it's, it's more so, yes. You know what I mean? The, the early converts of Islam definitely have a special status. You know what I mean? It, w w amongst us, period. You know, imagine if we, we go back and think about all of the stuff that they had to deal with, you know, practicing Islam in secret at first and, you know, being boycotted and, 
and like people like Bilal ibn Rabah was tortured and Sumaya, may Allah uh, 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 give her the highest rank in paradise. She got killed for believing in her, in her husband. Just think of all of the stuff that the early Muslims had to go through. So those who come in, even though, alhamdulillah, we Muslim, you understand? Because even as, as us as Muslims today, we have a special status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he goes out to Al-Baqi, and then he makes a, a special, uh, 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 like a, uh, this love that he got for us, and says that, you know, they, they, they loved me and never seen me before. So there's a special status that we have, you know, as Muslims who follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who follows Allah and his messenger, and we never seen the messenger of Allah, and we love him so much. Many of us can't even, sometimes we, we talk, and I'm, I mean, the messenger of Islam is, uh, what, like, oh, almost close to 15. I'm sitting there telling the story about when the prophet is, and when he died, and I'm sitting there, my eyes is well enough. You understand? So those are the kind of things in which we never seen the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we still, we still love the messenger of Allah. You know, so there's a special status that, that the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even talks about those of us who come after him. And who've never seen him and they love him. Yeah, you understand what I'm saying? So, but definitely the a person who even even there's a special status amongst the people of better compared to the other Muslims. Because there was a, a, a brother who he had given a letter and he, he said, you know, he was trying, he didn't have it, it, it looked like he was like betraying what the Prophet Islam, the Prophet Islam was trying to come in and um catch the, the the meccans by surprise so this person sends in a letter and he says um i did have rasulullah i i didn't have any intention on betraying it's islam at all but i don't have any family there like y'all do and i was hoping to win some kind of well my stuff and my family would be okay and then the prophet sallallahu wa sallam he said you know he's telling he's hey he's from better so it was like, you know, I'm not questioning because he got this special place because he fought in the Battle of Beth. You know, and even Omar ibn al-Khattab, he, when he became the caliph, he would even give the whoever fought in Beth, he even gave them like a stipend. You know what I mean? So definitely certain acts and people in certain situations, they have this, this beautiful status, you know, because of their sacrifice, you know, that they did for Islam, especially in the, when it wasn't as easy as it is as it is for us today. MashaAllah. Those are the only questions I have here. And if people in Zoom, you guys got any more? Good job, Edward. Yes. No, there was a letter. Okay, we good? Okay, I'm Lila. Okay, inshallah. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's permission, we'll be together next uh, week. And any good that came from this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And any mistakes that was uh, made is from me. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me for it. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik wa ashadu an la ilaha ila anta wa astaghfiruk wa atubu ulaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah.